Welcome to our second session. My name is Chris van Staden. Um, I'm with the China Global South project and also uh, with, uh, I have an affiliation with Stellenbosch University's School of Journalism as well. Um, and today uh, we are focusing on Africa's responses to, to China's global engagements. So, you know, China has been rapidly expanding its global presence um, across many, many fields at once. Um, and many of these have impacts on Africa or are drawing attention from Africa. So we're delighted to bring together a, a quite an eclectic panel um, of different perspectives of African responses to China's global presence. Um, so the, the speakers are going to have roughly about 10 minutes each, um, and then um, we'll, uh, we'll have a Q&A uh, discussion after that. Um, and um, we're aiming to end it around, uh, at around one. Um, so um, without further ado, I think um, we, let's start with our first presentation. Gideon Chitanga um, is a researcher for, uh, on the, at the, the Center for China-Africa Studies at the University of Johannesburg. Um, and he's looking at, at uh, negotiating U.S.-China competition and rivalry in Africa, reinserting African agency into the Africa-U.S.-China digital diplomacy. Um, go ahead, Gideon. Because I want to, to just share some brief thoughts on what is happening within um, the area of digital diplomacy and briefly maybe throw to the floor some ideas that can provoke a further discussion. So I am not going to be authoritative, but I'm going to give like a survey of the of the um, so a survey of the terrain, meaning the terrain being the, the area of digital diplomacy and, um, and uh, how that is shaping up uh, given e the geopolitical competition and rival rivalry between the US and China, which might change or not change uh, e since the meeting is of the two presidents for the two countries. Um, digital diplomacy e is yes become um, a major phenomenon that is a part and parcel of our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. E, there are so many different definitions of uh, uh, digital diplomacy, um, but the major string that ties the different uh, definitions is the idea that e, states are increasingly relying on, the, on new technologies e, for diplomatic engagements. And uh, diplomatic engagements in courts refers to uh, affairs of the states, either in um, international relations, in global affairs, e, or in the strict e, traditional definition uh, of diplomacy as being um, a space for interstate negotiation, negotiations, uh, representations e, for state interests, and uh, projection of power in some cases, people-to-people -people engagement. So depending on where you, you stand, you can narrow the definition of diplomacy or broaden it. I prefer a, a definition of digital diplomacy that, that embraces the role or that links the role of new technologies, not only as a platform or a space where our states engage, but um, digital technologies as a source of power and influence because such a definition it helps us to understand where Africa stands in the uh, um, uh, ecosystem of new technologies and particularly uh, digital diplomatic uh, technologies or technologies which are used in digital diplomacy. So having said that, uh, if you read about um, this a, a relatively new field, digital diplomacy, in, a, 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 and read it where it uh, concerns the African continent, you actually see a, a very basic pattern that um, African countries a, a lived, a, jumped in, 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 in the way that they became, began to embrace digital technology a, with the beginning of COVID, and uh, more and more states, state actors, uh, in rapidly out of necessity, began to embrace these technologies. 
e, because without these technologies, e, maybe diplomacy would have been uh, disrupted. E, and that process included e, the different practices that are associated with diplomacy e, and police engagements that are associated with um, a diplomacy. And this means negotiating e, summits between uh, African states, our amongst African states and African leaders, um, e, representations, and that process, which um, uh, was quickened uh, during the context of the of the of the COVID, uh, then I think opened up a new way of uh, of doing things, which has uh, evolved. So, so the use of new technology uh, or digital diplomacy in uh, many African countries since two thousand and one, if you like, uh, jumped and became a norm or a common practice. E, e, so many meetings happened e, via the different types of new technologies, e, Zoom, Teams, e, many leaders uh, started to use Twitter or, or what we call X now. E, Facebook took uh, a new dimension, not only as a social space for individuals, but also for state officials to pass official messages and so on and so on. E, so, so, so this change, I think, is very important for us to understand as uh, media practitioners because it provides us, uh, it takes us to different sources of information, but also uh, uh, we need to understand that uh, this is not just an innocent space. It's a space where different state uh, actors or different um, state interests are mediated and could be competing or they exactly compete. It is also important that as we, we think about the African continent, the space of uh, digital diplomacy, again, which is a definition of conundrum, can be broader. The, the basic definition focuses on the use of social media platforms linked to the COVID era. But um, what I would call convergence, digital convergence theories, they see they see digital diplomacy in a very broad space because then the argument becomes that uh, new technologies have become a way of life and a platform in the space uh, where everything uh, converges. Uh, not only technologies and the internet and 4IR and um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, but also economics, politics, society, and so on and so on. I think reflecting uh, uh, into digital diplomacy in this way, uh, sheds more insight than just looking at a digital technology as an avenue uh, through which um, uh, diplomacy or foreign policy or international relations is mediated. And um, in my brief comments, I'm going to, to rely on this um, uh, definition, the broader definition that is located uh, within um, uh, technological convergence theorists, because it opens a broader window through which we can see the use of technologies within the context of uh, global competition and how that um, shapes up with the African agents in the sense of African interests and representation and managing diplomacy and international relations. Now, uh, having said this, I think I want to just give quick comments of um, the state of uh, digital diplomacy slash technologies in the continent and how um, that is being used and benefiting the African continent. A lot of studies that look into this field, they basically look at um, uh, the absor absorption of new technologies or if you like, proliferation of new technologies. The African continent is a big market of new technologies. The African mar market is a consumer of the diverse new technologies, whether from the US or, or from China and how these technologies are, are impacting the continent from the perspective of socioeconomic development, techpreneurs, employment creation, and at the level of the state, how these technologies have provided another layer for diplomatic engagement, mediation of international relations or foreign relations. What is interesting for me is that um, if you group uh, these relations, say you break them up into uh, what we would call economic diplomacy broadly, 
in international relations and um, uh, international relations in the sense of um, uh, political actors and the activities of the state, uh, economic diplomacy uh, and public diplomacy that relates to people to people. Uh, you will find that the manner in which Africa uh, interacts with either China or the US uh, or benefits from China or the US varies. Uh, let's just highlight a bit how um, um, uh, this is expressed in the in the in the in relations between uh, Africa and the U.S. and then China and the U.S. and then I'll pass my comments and stop. So uh, we understand that um, um, I think until the 2000s, uh, Africa was not a major uh, policy priority for for the U.S. Uh, there's a debate uh, as to which American leader really took Africa into, embraced Africa into a, a main uh, foreign policy issue. Uh, I think we can debate about that whether uh, Trump lowered Africa or raised some say George Bush, but it's very clear that um, Biden has emphasized this and has branded the policy uh, that he has said uh, the back in to Africa as a major intervention. And what you see when you look at um, uh, digital diplomacy uh, from the perspective of uh, the Biden administration, it is a key component of a policy of re-engaging Africa. The second thing is that um, based on the American political model, it's more focused on engaging with uh, the private sector and tech premiers and using uh, this economic diplomacy he weighted economic diplomacy as a way of engaging and exercising leverage he, he with the African continent. And of course, there is a reciprocity from African he, tech players, social media users, and so on and so on, who are engaging he, that way. He, at the level of state-to-state -state, investment in new technologies is key in every aspect of uh, what the U.S. is trying to, to do with the African continent. The major difference is that it's focusing on extending these tech-based relations and collaboration and cooperation uh, uh, through the private sector while you're trying to influence states and uh, the regional level to align um, the rules of engagement and governance of uh, the tech space. When you look at China, China has a different model, mainly uh, based on state-to-state -state relations. So uh, where it's driven by uh, Chinese companies, uh, these companies are heavily backed by the Chinese state. Uh, and um, the, the, the difference here is that uh, in terms of cooperation between China and the African continent or African countries, the cooperation is mainly between states. Uh, and there is huge investment, I think, um, since 2000, which has gone into different technologies. And these technologies, they are stimulating a dynamic, um, if you want, evolution of tech-centered economics, tech-centered politics, tech-centered uh, digital participation in very diverse, diverse ways in different countries. China obviously is more invested in uh, in uh, in technologies in Africa. If uh, you were to refer to to the tech stake, uh, some I think it's a Kenyan uh, activist and scholar who actually sketched the tech stake and demonstrates the intersectionality of different levels of technologies where China is involved, uh, and it spreads uh, it covers the whole of the East African Belt, but also uh, different companies. Um, are invested in all sides of the African continent. So these layers, I think they can be compressed into various aspects of what we call diplomacy beyond just the use of our social media platforms. Because in the economic, um, um, uh, economic infrastructure, broader economic and technological infrastructure, it also represents a diplomatic leverage. Now, where are the contradictions? The contradictions are at different levels. Why I chose the definition that I chose, I wanted to underline the fact that 
there is absorption and proliferation of new technologies in the continent. But a key point is that Africa does not produce any of the new te technologies that are used either within the strict political space or broadly in the economic space. And when you reflect on agents, agents as acting, agents as self-representation, agents as a voice, you, you will realize that the African voice at some point will be limited. When you think of internet governance or governing new technologies, you will realize that the extent to which we seek to govern these new technologies is limited because we are only governing the secondary aspects of the ecosystem. If you think of data centers, if you think of A1, AI, if you think of 4IR, the US and China are at a more advanced stage. When President Biden and President Xi Jinping were meeting, part of the discussion was to think of governing artificial intelligence. If that conversation might happen in the continent, but it's happening in the context of a governing something that does not exist, that we don't have, that we don't produce. And I think this applies to the different technologies that are needed. And for media practitioners, I think the key thing that we should uh, start to think about beyond the adversities of new technology is where and how can Africa start to produce its own technologies instead of only applying and replicating and using technologies from either the US or China. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we uh, can move on directly to Shang Chen, who's joining us from Beijing, um, focusing on US and Chinese tobacco companies in Zimbabwe, so socioeconomic impacts and their corporate social responsibility strategies. Um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, can I first ask whether you can see and hear me clearly? Yes, we can see and hear you. Okay, thank you. So, I'll first share my screen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Xiang Chen, calling from Beijing, China. I'm currently attending Peking University, reading for a degree in foreign languages and a minor in sociology. I'm really honored to be part of this forum and to have the opportunity to learn from so many incredible scholars and journalists working on China, Africa. And this summer, I did my field work in four provinces and eight farms in Zimbabwe. I mainly looked at Chinese and U.S. investments in the tobacco sector of Zimbabwe, especially in terms of their labor relations, socioeconomic impacts, and CSR, so corporate social responsibility strategies. And before digging into the specifics of the Chinese and um, American companies, there is something that I want to clarify first. So there is something that I want to talk about regarding China's tobacco industry, the, the very nature of it. That is, China's tobacco industry has a state monopoly system, and China Tobacco Company is one of the largest state-owned enterprises in China, and it, genera and it generates over a trillion RMB of tax revenue for the country every year. The China Tobacco International has subsidiaries in many parts of the world, and any companies that wishes to any company that wishes to sell to mainland China needs to enter the market through China Tobacco Company. And in the case of Zimbabwe, China Tobacco International has 10 suppliers, including its full subsidiary Tianzi, which I will talk about the specifics later. And its purchase volume um, is around 700 million tons every year, which accounts for approximately 40% of the total tobacco production of Zimbabwe. And these are here is a list of all the companies that I have looked into. So the company that I have spent most of my time dealing with is Tianzi Tobacco, which is a wholly owned subsidiary to China National Tobacco Company. And Tianzi was formal, formally established in 2005 and has been practicing contract farming ever since. So basically, Basically, there are two sales models of tobacco in Zimbabwe. The first is the auction model and the other is the contract model. So in terms of the uh, auction model, and let's take the capital city of Zimbabwe, Harare, as an example, there are currently two auction floors. There used to be three, but the bulk of floors are no longer used as an auction floor. So currently, there are only the TSF and the premium auction floors. 
so the the auction system works like this the farmers will bring their tobacco to the floors and the company representatives will do the bidding and then they will buy the tobacco and so this is pretty simple and the contract model is basically like the company will provide the inputs needed for tobacco farming and curing and such inputs would typically include fertilizers seedlings fuel and corresponding and also the funding for for the construction of corresponding facilities, etc., and tobacco produced under the contract farming system is sold as a at a price slightly higher than the auction house by three to five percent, with production input funds deducted after the tobacco is purchased after the unified management of the TIMB, which stands for Tobacco Industry and Marketing Board, and the remainder of the money will be paid back to the tobacco farmer. And currently, Tianzi Tobacco Company um, co cooperates mainly with commercial farmers and contracts around 110 of those farmers. It is ranked fourth in terms of um, tobacco market share in Zimbabwe, and it is the main case that I looked into. And the other Chinese company that I looked into is the Anhui Agriculture Reclamation Group. Unlike Tianzi, which is a central SOE, central state-owned enterprise, this company, the Anhui Agriculture Reclamation Group, is a local SOE because it's administrated by the Anhui province. Um, so it's not the size, it's not as large as that of Tianzi. And the main focus of um, this Anhui company is not tobacco. So tobacco is only part of its business. And it also doesn't contract farmers directly. They're just tobacco growers and they sell to Tianzi. So I tend to call this company um, a company that's subcontracted by Tianzi. And currently there are around 20 to 30 Chinese companies like this in Zimbabwe. And like I said before, tobacco growing is just a small fraction of their business. And in terms of, of American tobacco companies, um, here I listed three companies. However, um, it might not be that accurate to call the first two as American company. The first two are Mashal and Tobacco Company, which and uh, the, abbrevi the abbreviated form is MTC, and the other is Zimbabwean Leaf Tobacco, ZLT. Um, the reason why I listed them here is that um, they have U.S. investors on board, and part of their tobacco is sold to the U.S. However, those two companies, they're registered as local tobacco companies in Zimbabwe. And these two companies are very influential in Zimbabwe's tobacco industry, as they're usually among the top three in terms of their market share. And they mainly contract small-scale farmers, which is different from TNZ, who contracts mainly commercial farmers. And the only company that's 100% U.S. is Philip Morris Tobacco. But um, it's but this company like withdrew from Zimbabwe and after the fast track land reform that happened in the 2000s and also following the subsequent large scale sanctions that Zimbabwe has been facing from the West. And this is a company that's very famous worldwide. It's based in the U.S. and has branches all over the world. As I said, they used to operate in Zimbabwe. So during my during my field work, I also interviewed some farmers who had engaged with them before. And my uh, comparison in that regard is most is mostly based on their memories of interacting with them. And I tried to do some comparisons there. So I'll mainly follow two lines of comparison. One is horizontal. I will compare Chinese companies with MTC and ZLT in terms of their contemporary practices, which include but not lim are not limited to their social, economic, and environmental impacts. There's also a vertical one, a historical comparison, since Philip Morris is no longer active in Zimbabwe. So I'll also make some comparisons based on my interviews with those farmers. And here is a map of Zimbabwe that I put in here. So, sorry. Okay. Um, I've circled the places that I did most of my field work. I did most of my scholar and government official interviews in the capital city of Harare. According to managers of TNZ, the tobacco growing areas in Zimbabwe are usually located within a 200 kilometer radius around Harare. So I visited tobacco farms in four, pro four places surrounding Harare, namely Beaches, Jimba, Marondera, and Vorwi in Mashal and East, West, and Central provinces. I interviewed over 40 farmers, farm workers, scholars, and government officials. And the government officials um, mostly come from the Ministry of Agriculture, Zimbabwe Tobacco Association, Zimbabwe Tobacco Growers Association, and Tobacco Industry and Marketing Board, TIMB. So going to the first line of the comparison that we're seeing here, I listed four aspects. 
The first is about inputs. I think this is the most important strategy that TNZ uses to attract farmers and establish its good image. Um, according to my discussions with the TNZ executive board members and the TNZ farmers, TNZ charges zero interest for the inputs while ZLT charges around 12% of interest. Um, and however, in this year, TNZ starts to charge interest, but it's still much lower compared to other countries. The farmers told me this year, TNZ is charging 4% of interest, um, which is still much lower compared to the 12% of other companies. And also, TNZ has a very low default rate. The manager told me that 99.4% of farmers could pay back the loan last year. But under ZLT and MTC, some farmers I met told me that paying back loans has been very stressful for them. But here I want to note an important factor underlying this phenomenon, that is most farmers contracted to TNZ are those that are relatively rich and influential. So before they were contracted, they were already grow growing high quality tobacco in large hectares of land, and TNZ just helped them to grow tobacco up a notch. And as for ZLT and MTC, that are dealing with small scale farmers, because these farmers are oftentimes not experienced enough, I think it's natural that their default rates will be higher. So I'd argue that TNZ's success is not necessarily related to the company itself, rather the farmers themselves also play a big role. And the second part is about the contract model. I won't elaborate too much on this part since I already explained in the I already explained the mechanism earlier. My main point here is basically all TNZ farmers are growing China-style tobacco, which is, which supplies mainland China. So the China-style tobacco is mainly that kind of yellow, oranges um, tobacco leaf, which contains lower levels of nicotine and higher levels of sugar. But ZLT and MTC, they're, the kind of tobacco that they grow are kind of mixed. They can also They also supply Europe and the US. But I think there is a trend that their farmers are increasingly growing China style tobacco as China has a large, such a large um, market of tobacco uh, of smokers and also because of the prices that TNZ offers is relatively higher compared to other countries, uh, compared to other companies. And the third aspect is regarding the relationship um, with the black farmers. Um, actually, um, um, I'm actually I'm here and this description may not be that accurate. I'm actually going to talk about the relationship with the employees, especially black employees. So the farmer, uh, the employees, um, the one of the drivers at TNZ Tobacco Company told me that when TNZ came in around 2005, not long after that, Zimbabwe mm, like suffered from hyper hyperinflation and at that time, everyone wanted U.S. dollars and they did not really want the local currency. And TNZ was one of the few companies that um, gave their employees 100% salary in U.S. dollars, while the other companies, they still give them like a large percentage of local currency. So this is something that a lot of employees of TNZ have told me about. And they are very grateful that TNZ um, was able to do this kind of gesture, gesture to help them live through that period of difficulty. And the fourth aspect is about environmental impacts. Um, so in the case of TNZ, because they mainly deal with commercial farmers, those farmers, they use coal to cure the tobacco, which is relatively environmentally friendly compared to, um, let's say, timber, which is what the small holder farmers use. And I think a, um, a big problem regarding um, the use of timber, especially for smallholder farmers, is that a lot of them, they cut down trees, they cut down indigenous trees in order to grow, in order to cure tobacco. And actually, it should have been the responsibility of the company to supply the farmers with um, like seeds of the gum trees that are specifically used for curing. But some companies, they're not doing that kind of CSR aspect very well. So they just and let those farmers, they cut down indigenous trees, and this has caused some environmental concerns and controversies. And um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the withdrawal of Philip Morris. So after the Zimbabwe fast track land reform, um, a massive scale of Western sanctions and fleet in, and also um, there was um, many companies, especially US companies, they withdrew from the market and Philip Morris was no exception. Um, the only big company that stayed, a Western company that stayed in Zimbabwe, I think was, 
I think is the British American Tobacco, BAT. Um, we do not really know why. I've also discussed this with the Ministry of Agricultural people, but they told me that um, it did not withdraw from the market alongside um, companies like Philip Morris. And based on my discussions with the farmers, they're telling me that um, at that time, Philip Morris, com compared to the working conditions that they had under Philip Morris and the, comp and the working conditions that they had now under the Chinese companies, they feel like the working conditions then were better. They, um, I mean, when I was interviewing farm workers on Chinese farms, some of them are telling me that um, there are several family members that have to be, um, that have, that that were crowded that they have to live in the same room and there were not enough living space for them so some farmers were telling me that however when they were contracted to us or uk companies they feel like that kind of living conditions and also the entertainment options were usually um, much more varied and also more diverse but i wouldn't um, call this a conclusive um, statement or I, I wouldn't say very firmly about this because the sample size that I collected is, is very small. And um, among those, the number of ZLT, um, NTC, NPM farmers are and even like the number is even smaller. So I would say that might be a coincidence, but that's what some farmers have been telling me about. And also there are some sourcing and quality control standards. Um, they're telling me that um, companies like TNZ, they're willing to buy from the auction floors. Um, but for some US and UK companies, they do not do that because of sourcing concerns. I mean, it's much harder to source the tobacco um, in an auction floor compared to the contract floor because with a contract farmer, you basically know all the information about his farm and also the growing of the tobacco, etc. So um, this is a very brief comparison that I can make here. But since the company is no longer active and the farmers that I can find are relatively mm, like I, I couldn't find many of them. So I think this part is rather weak. And now moving on to my conclusions. So the first conclusion is about the latecomer advantage, the case of TNZ. And sorry for the typo here. Um, I think TNZ, when it came in in 2004, 2005, it could already leverage the existing farming expertise of experienced farmers. I mean, at that time, um, companies like BAT or PM have or, had already been operating in the country for a long time. And also there's a trend that I want to note here that is even though we uh, a lot of people tend to associate Chinese companies overseas with those labor or environmental controversies, I tend to think of Chinese state owned companies, especially the case of Tianzi, as a different one. I mean, those state owned companies, they have different imperatives and they are not just prox and like profit maximizer they're not profit maximizers but, but rather profit makers in the sense that they also take on diplomatic roles i mean they represent the image of the company so they tend to do more like corporate social responsibility things we're seeing the a lot like some um, elementary schools and also clinics and um also orphanage being built by tnz and also they're um, like training farmers they're giving them um, inputs free and uh, free of interest so i think um, the trend is that they're not that um, driven to make the biggest amount of profits as possible but rather they have other imperatives that they should also consider and the second part is regarding the similarities in terms of their contracting model i won't elaborate a lot on this because um, as I've already mentioned before, TNZ was the one that introduced the contract model to Zimbabwe and many companies have followed suit. So I think it's natural that the model is relatively similar. It's just that the interest rates or the, um, the, the amount of money that they were willing to invest in the farmers are different. But I mean, um, it's not there. There isn't that much of a drastic difference in terms of their contract model, and the third part that I want to note here is the low pay prevalent among general farm workers. When I was interviewing a Tianzi farm worker in um, in Marondera, um, a general hand worker told me that they're only earning sixty dollars every month, and when I checked the general general minimum minimum wage standards, I found that most of the companies, they also paid this amount. And um, 
when I talked to the farmers, they told me that they think this is too little compared, and even though they are being supplied with accommodation and also food, but they still think that like this is relatively a like mm, a rather serious low pay situation. And the last point that I want to make here is about environmental implications and controversies, because most of the farmers in Zimbabwe, they're still smallholder farmers, and a lot of them still cut down indigenous trees to cure tobacco. And this is something that I think the ministry and also the TIMB, they should look into like how mm, we could um, for example, introduce more regulations to the companies to let them to um, supply the seeds of the gum trees or to use coal instead of um, indigenous trees to cure tobacco so that the environmental implications may not be that severe um, as it is now. So basically, this is my presentation and I'm looking forward to the feedback from all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's great. It was really fascinating. Um, moving right along, um, I, Blair, I think, unfortunately, won't be able to join us today. Um, so we're handing over to Diana. Um, Diana Chiwanga is a freelance journalist and photographer. She's looking at um, women exclusion in, co in cold economies, just transitions and climate change in South Africa. Thank you so much. Um, Women exclusion in coal economy, just transition and climate change in South Africa. Will just transition be the solution to mitigate? Will just transition be the solutions to mitigate climate change issues? So this idea came around. Um, the idea in question came around after attending several consultations with the Presidential Climate Commission in Limpopo and um, Pumalanga province early last year. So during this consultation, women in the community near coal fired uh, power plants raised their voices included, and included their submissions about the challenges that they are faced with and finding it difficult for them to imagine a prosperous net zero 2050 economy as they are presently excluded from the coal economy and instead they have to deal with health impacts of pollutants from coal mines and coal plants. The effects of the pollution are that they end up failing their health and safety tests at mines and coal plants, rendering them unemployable. When I was doing this project, um, there was an assessment that was completed last year. It echoes research and uh, the findings were that um, vulnerability in the, in the coal sector is highly affected by gender. And it finds that women living in coal mining areas um, do not benefit much from the financial but are disproportionately affected by their adverse impacts. To restore the dignity and rights of women who were left behind during the, the era of fossil fuel powered industrialization South Africa has an opportunity regarding the just transition process to be more transparent and inclusive and for women to be included in the policy making process and implementations. And in research on renewable solution will be mainstream for gender from the drawing board down to the real world uh, implementation. In addition to the gender balance and monitoring audits, I believe it also helped to ensure the, gen the just energy transition travels in the right direction for South Africa's women. During the documentation of this project, uh, which took place last year, I think a um, few weeks before the decommissioning of Gomardi, um, fired plant in the eastern South Africa's coal rich Mpumalanga province in 2022, um, I had an opportunity to interview women around Gomardi and, and Mildelbeck. And they highlighted a legacy of sex for job in the mining communities. Also, they highlighted the issues of con contaminated water affecting their sexual and other health, as well as concerns about life after coal in a province that relies on the coal value chain for over 50% of provincial GDP. The just transition conversation is dominated by concerns about how changes to the industry will affect uh, male employment. 
unpacking the just transition in South Africa and overcoming challenges of climate change, um, Energy Enterprise Minister um, Pravin Gordon said during his address at the first China Africa New Energy Investment and Cooperation Conference in, certain, in, in June 22. He highlighted, and I quote, while going through those changes, the right institutions should be put in place to manage the journey of energy transition, climate change, and the lack of energy, security impacts from household economies, and can result in geopolitical issues. I close quote. Yet women are affected too, with growing evidence that in coal communities, they will, be, they will be more vulnerable to changes wrought by South Africa's energy transition, especially in the mining communities. To increase opportunities for women, for example, in the country's growing solar PV sector, could provide opportunities and diverse skill and help to address the gender imbalance in employment and pay. It also includes working al alongside renewable energy companies, association to bridge the gender gap in the energy sector and on employment and pay. 2023 marks 25 years of diplomatic ties between China and South Africa and in strengthening these bilateral ties for mutual benefit. The Chinese ambassador to South Africa, Shen Zhengdong, said that uh, during the investment conference that they are seeing unprecedented energy challenges in South Africa and these two countries need to cooperate more on renewables and implementation and have information exchange and see practical cooperation, advanced cooperation in technical training and improved pro professional capacity. And being said that, and in advancing gender for just energy transition, the scale of South Africa's just energy transition involves the significant redistribution of resources and opportunities opening up the potential for better pathways for women. And this is backed by the deepening BRICS cooperation with China agreeing to partner with South Africa's efforts to industrialize further and to transition to greener energy manufacturing economy. As I conclude, I would like to borrow a few words from Professor Paul Zilungiselele Tembe's new book, Xi Jinping and Thriving South Africa, relations in the new era, and I quote, initially the concept of just transition was promoted through the environmental protection rationale to ensure that worker and community rights were considered. And although the idea gradually made its way to climate agenda, it was mainly within the context of developed nations. Today, however, according to a 2022 study reported by China Dialogue, the calls for just energy transition in South Africa and across the continent are now louder than those concerned with jobs for workers in fossil fuel industry. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, uh, our last presentation is by, by Yuko Zhao uh, from uh, both Rose Lake Ventures um, and the London School of Economics. Um, she's focusing on digital innovations from, from below, how Chinese and American investors make a difference to African tech entrepreneurs. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Yuke Zhao, I'm from China, I'm now studying in UK in LSC. So, next quick uh, startup about my topic about digital innovation from the below, which is focused on the venture capital flow from US and China to Africa, uh, which is a little bit different from the top-down approach, uh, from the state-to-state -state approach. And uh, this is structured today, and I will just quickly go through the background, and then we'll talk about US-China's position in Africa as a continent, and then we'll just pose some challenges and think about the future thing. Okay, to quick think about Africa as a, as a future, as a very, a big emerging market. In 2022, Africa among the world is the only continent to, in, to just experience the huge increase and a very rapid development. 
So that's why Africa is kind of different from other emerging markets. For, for example, the South Asia, for example, the Latin America. So it is kind of unique to consider Africa in today's tech and uh, today's market, particularly the global market. And think about China and the US. We well, know that these two are the two largest uh, economy in the world. But what is interesting is that their tech performances in, uh, in the world and also in Africa. We can know that in 2050, China just became the biggest patent granted. So, which means that to some extent, China turned out like uh, maybe the promising future for tech entrepreneurs and also for tech innovations. And by now, uh, U.S. still continue to be the biggest R&D and uh, biggest VC investment uh, country in the world. We can say that USA um, is just remain the first place when we consider the uh, research and development and uh, VC investment. And also, they both activity act, actively uh, perform in Africa since 2000. And things have changed a lot when we consider the, the VC part, the private sector part. So let's to move to the next part. Until now, I, uh, the U.S. still remain the primary source of VC tech investments in Africa. And uh, it is not only about the active American investment institutions, like the big names, like Golden Sock, like the Sequoia in investment, but also they just supported the dollar donated front for local initiatives. So that's why we consider U.S. in tech particularly in VC tech, it's not only their investors, the US investors, but also the global, oh, sorry, the local investors which gain money, which, which, uh, which gain some funds from the US investors. And uh, also we know that some, uh, in 2023, among the top eight, top 10 investment institutions, uh, in Africa, there are only one Chinese invested, only one investment institute with Chinese background who is active in uh, Africa investment, which is kind of weird comparing to the mega project done by Chinese governments, by Chinese state owned companies. And also, when we considering the backstage investment, which means that um, the unicorns, for example, there are probably eight unicorns in Africa now, but all of them get funds from the USA uh, investors, not from China. There's no Chinese investor who just successfully invest in the Africa unicorn. This is kind of interesting. And uh, also, in some from my interviewees, some local founders also tend to favor Africa venture capitalists because they have many funds, they have many capitals, also, they have introduced many late stage uh, investors to them. So they have a very huge network. They have a very huge capital in them. So that's why many local uh, founders just want to build a long term relationship with the Africa investors. And we're discussing this impact of Chinese investors on the tech ecosystem in, in, in Africa, a general partner from the Chinese venture capital just de describe as follows. You can see that uh, raising more than $200 is just a walk in the park. There's no denying that in the realm of Africa tech, it is dominated by the Af Afri uh, American capital. Chinese investors are involved in infrastructure, of course, while Europeans and Africans are reaping the benefits of this t internet boom. And in the new emerging market outside Southeast Asia, and China's influence in the internet is almost negligent. So that's why many Chinese uh, investors who want to learn more about Afri Africa are still on the way to there. They have not in that. So let's talk about China's role. Considering that China's Mac factory and uh, internet business models, Chinese Maybe Chinese investors offer some support for local startups as an alternative. And the fundamental factor is that the shift of the garment manufacturing industry from China 
and the Southeast Asia to East. So I just use this as a case to illustrate the uh, China's role in Africa tech, particularly the e-commerce. And first, because of the lower cost of the labor in the region, and uh, second, because of the availability of the numerous tax in incentives for Africa-produced goods, which are many exported to European and uh, American markets. And the move, maybe last but not the least factor, is that many Chinese manufacturers just relocating their production bases to Africa. That's why uh, East Africa, particularly Kenya, is emerging as a hub for clothing manufacturing. This is significant Africa's growing capacity to produce affordable clothes and gradually replacing the demand for the second-hand garments. And then, Jack Ma, uh, which is the founder of Alibaba, and also um, Xi Yin, which is popular when you consider e-commerce, just came to Africa. And Chinese e-commerce platforms have introduced some distinctive business model to all the Africa startups. I taking taking the case of Xi Yin, and Xi Yin has now captured an increasing percentage in the U.S. market, and now it turns out to be maybe the major player in this sector, and. I just have a few talks with some. Um, oh, sorry. I just have few talks with some um, uh, Africa founders about uh, e-commerce. They just told me that uh, they're exploring the platforms such as TikTok, the Raid, the Shane, and they want to combine these business models to their own business, to their own startups. And for example, they want to transform the traditional e-commerce from the web-centric and to a content-driven approach. And which is means that it can establish Africa's fashion consumer ecosystem to a more advanced one. And this is involved creating a fashion ecosystem experience through various forms such as live streaming and such as videos, images, and also to complete the shopping experience. And then uh, some founder just adapted a strategy to the characteristic of the East Africa internet ecosystem, emphasizing the localization. They just used, for example, Chinese model and to localize this model to better adapt to the Africa, to particularly Kenya's uh, basic conditions. And then they understand that the role of data-driven approach, noting that due to the high data costs in East Africa, the core of the content marketing is not live streaming, which is happening in China, but the images. So the, the Africa founders, the Kenya founders, just know better how to perform, how to use the e-commerce in Africa. Now it's the one copy from the China mainland. And uh, also, uh, similarly, the advantages of China's manufacturing industry can provide founders with some cost-effective suppliers for both hardware and software components. For example, Kenya again, digitalizing management pl platforms, and they just meant they want to digitalize some traditional like suppliers, like retainers into a digi digitalized one. And they're just facing almost zero hardware and software infrastructure. When, want, when they want to help with the local restaurants and integrate into the cloud-based ecosystem. And they, they have to use the post system, the obtaining po point of sale system, and they want, to, they want it at a lower cost because it is essential to reduce their operational expenses. So in the early age of establishing a restaurant management enterprise, for example, China, Chinese investors just facilitate the connection with the post device manufacturers in China and also coordinate the complementary software and assist the founders in the securing the lowest market prices. That's why Chinese investors can bring such very uh, low price uh, devices to the African funders. And uh, also, there's some interesting story happening. The individuals from Ghana, Kenya, and more countries who have worked in the telecommunication companies with Chinese spectrums, like Huawei, they just start to know the potential of the potential of the digitalization by uplift people from poverty through the working in Huawei and in techno Chinese companies and then they start their business. This is quite an interesting when, when you compare the fact that many Africa founders just grew up in USA, grew up in the Europe and Europe and also start uh, pursue their higher education there and get their work there and then they go back to Africa to 
start their business. There's a kind of a new trend where you're considering Chinese involvement in the Africa tech. So just like Marvin once said that the most crucial capability is that ability to connect the experiences of Africa and China. We need to stay rooted in reality and identity uh, junior needs and engage in visits and learning. And for example, understanding how Alibaba integrates resources is invaluable. This is value that Chinese investors can bring to us. Learning from the successful experience of Chinese enterprises and establish collaboration with them is essential. So things are not always turn out very good, right? So we can we have to face the fact that they're still happening some bad things. And a, for example, the development of sustainable investment strategies still falls short. In terms of exist, the major the majority of Africa tech enterprises exist throughout the joint ventures and, uh, and acquisitions, while exists being relatively less common compared to the transaction value and IPOs even rare. This is not only indicates that tech ecosystem is still in the early age, and also suggests that the local tech startups continue to follow a financialized in, in investment, providing per, priority the rapid fundraising and switch organizing the funds. And in the Africa tech ecosystem, Kenya, Nigeria, Egypt, and South Africa stand out in terms of the X, with the big four showcasing the promi uh, prominent exit performances. And compared to the global trend where the execs are con concentrated among the seven year mark, Africa tech startups tend to exit earlier. And considering that the previous chart, that, sorry, so uh, the first one, it can be inferred that a significant number of enterprises may experience a stagnation in the early stage in the fundraising, which means that they have to stop their entrepreneur, entrepreneurship in the early age, like two or four years. And also, this trend largely stems from the short-term investment strategies adopted by many investors in Africa startups. For investors, this approach allows them to speculate on portfolio valuations, expedite fundraising, and swiftly exact to reap. Like multiple interview, I just have many interviews which has mentioned that um, private entity groups like the VC and corporation are more likely to acquire the company with higher capital efficiency. And in the case of Jumia, a very famous Africa e-commerce um, platform, they mentioned that despite the company's initial positive performance on the New York Stock Exchange, it faced challenges due to the fraud and also short selling activities, which means to some extent it is not sustainable. And also for the entrepreneurs, it implies that the research business model and optimizing the product and operations are now the primary focus. Instead, there is a tendency to hurriedly capture the market share under the pressure of investors, prioritizing the short-term gains. This approach can impact the long-term development of the company. And for, for example, in some of the listed internet tech, tech startups, it is required to allocate 40% to 15% of the fundraising amount to marketing, only to marketing, rather than product development or technological research and development. So which means that I have to throw a large amount of money on marketing itself, not about to improve their uh, services, to improve their products. That's kind of weird when you're considering to develop in your long term. And also, the second thing I think we should be paying attention to is the VC investors prioritize the founders with the backgrounds from the US and the Europe, which is not, I think, from my perspective, it's not a good thing. And I just used the data reviews in 2022. Among the top eight African startups that secured the highest amount of the venture capitals in Africa, only two were led by the CEO of Nigeria and Egypt nationality. Uh, six, other six are all led by P from USA, from UK, 
And also, according to a research in 2017, across the East Africa region, only 10% of all funding for startups went to local founders. Particularly in Kenya, 70% 70, 70 of startups that received million dollars or more of venture capital investment in 2080 was laid by the white founder, despite the exploratory community making up only 0.15 of the population. And also, I have to mention that many in the global heavyweights, such as Golden Sox, such as um, Sequoia Capital, have all invested more frequently in Africa startups with weight elites involved, involved than they have invested from that by the local founders. And I have to admit that Chinese investors follow the path of so-called Western VCs. Several big Chinese VCs, like Hongshan China and Marico, mainly invest in startups run by Chinese. So in my interview with the industry professionals in the US, they just emphasize that placing great value on the founder themselves rather than investment strategy, focus on business models or products or services. Some investors acknowledge that a sheer consensus that priority the founders with education and work backgrounds in the Europe or in the US. In the US. And for potentially Chinese investors, investing founders with a Chinese background is seen as a lower risk thing. And because it can just minimize the impact of cultural gaps and the language barriers. So, but considering that when you do some global things, we want to do some international investment, these things cannot be a barrier. The language and the cultural gap cannot be a barrier when you consider investing in Africa from China. So we move to maybe the future, maybe the solutions. And I just have several interviews with the local startup founders. They just mentioned that we should reduce reliance on the experience and the experientialism, which means that the Chinese investor, the U.S. Uh, investors, the European investor cannot only focus on copy the strategies, copy the business models from the USA, from China, from the European into directly into Africa. This is not a good thing. And what they want, they want do is that we can use their business model as an example to analyze how can we success, but we must localize this our business model. That's the best thing. And also for the investors, they have to forget about their success in the USA or in China because things are totally different in Africa, in particular in di uh, different countries. Like Kenya situation is totally different from Nigeria. So for the investors, we should throw away all our experience, maybe part of our experience from the from uh, from from our mainland, from our homeland to considering Africa or considering a specific country where you want to totally uh, do something uh, good, do something really tailored to the market. And uh, also, we should reduce bias and engage in the only equal dialogue. And uh, I, just, I just have several conversations with some, uh, some coordinator and investor from the UK. And he is kind of he, he's from uh, he's from Uganda, and he just refer it like uh, he just refer some uh, American and Chinese investor like racist because they only invest those who were familiar with America with or China. Not they are not trusting the founders from the local, so that's a problem. And so. In his words, he wants to emphasize that we should decolonize the investment to some extent to try, really trust and reduce our bias when you want to really invest in the future of tech in Africa. I think it is kind of useful when you really consider the investors who have limited knowledge in Africa, who have limited experience in, in, in Africa, and who have buyers who have stereotypes in Africa. This is very important when the outsider came into this, this continent and say, I want to invest you. You have to follow, follow me. No, that, that's wrong. And today, OK. Today, I, I just want to follow in my thoughts that whether we are come from Africa or Asia, it, it is with determination 
and it is with the radiance and uh, respect and equal collaboration that we can truly recreate value. And it is with the quality that we can embark on a developmental journey, take control of our own destiny, and change the narrative of our history, and shape a shared future all together to throw away all the barriers and stereotypes. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Uh, we're almost at lunch. That's almost the end of the session, uh, but we have time for one round of questions. Um, any questions from the floor? Um, while you're thinking, I'll, I'll quickly throw in uh, one from my side, just for Diana. Um, you know, like in, in the Just Energy Transition Partnership, uh, there's been, uh, with the one between South Africa and, and, and the G7, there's been this allocation of money to, to, to try and kind of like have an actual just transition and to move people, to move employment out of the coal industry into other sectors. Um, in your opinion, how optimistic should we be that that will actually happen? There was a question, uh, I think, on, on X uh, two days ago about this allocation of funds. I think it was raised by people uh, based on the, on the, I think it's a News24 article, that uh, Germany is also pledging to help South Africa. But the question was, what happened to the 8.5 billion that South Africa received uh, during the COP27, if not mistaken? So I think the, 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 the issue there is how these funds are, 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 are allocated and with Komarti has been closed now, where are we? Has the repurposing started? Who is being reskilled? Are the mining, mine workers, the previous mine workers being reskilled? So the question is, where are these funds going? Mm. Yeah, that's my thoughts. Yeah, um, yeah go, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, we will like, take your question and Thank then you. your question and then your question. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this opportunity is very fruitful and vibrant for, every, for everyone, including myself as a female in Africa. Uh, I would like to say Africa China is a great project that I believe is going to expand the horizon of the majority numbers. Yes, indeed, we are in a transforming uh, nation that is just lacking the bit of support in every sort of way because uh, when you're looking at international investors that come with the interest to invest in Africa, the question and the gaps that are left open are only diverted to only certain groups. Uh, why I say that the entrepreneurship space that the lady mentioned, Ms. Yuk Zaho, she mentioned um, entrepreneurship space. And I think that's a very important, serious um, sector that it's being taken for granted. There's young people that I've come across. I'm in the mining space, by the way. And there's a lot of room for integration to take place and transform and develop. I mean, our, let's not go far, our very own schools. Everybody wants to play the game of uh, blaming whoever, blame that one, and everyone self-absorbed. But I love this project because I believe our interest is to say which groups are such funds accessible to. Maybe, uh, the, for example, in the past we had certain funds given to the DTI, uh, IDC, you know. Which groups should an ordinary entrepreneur access through such uh, programs that they get to attend and how can they get um, a quick response of uh, being supported in the, in the tech uh, industry from skills training development where you are having your own groups of companies or entrepreneurs that own businesses and more specifically in the mine sector and you want to develop these skills and enhance the, the direction of transformation. Who do you knock on the door? Like in, even in the institutions, I mean, including VERTS, it's, it's a doorstep away. You know, I think it would be nice to just get direction as to where do we even start. Great, thank you. Um, can, like, there was another question on that side. Thank you for this opportunity. I think we all agree that um, so far the conversations have been interesting and eye-opening as well. I mean, there's a part of the investment part where, I mean, South Africa, for instance, is one of China's uh, largest trade partners, right, on the continent. But it was interesting to hear that um, China doesn't really uh, invest uh, in, like, the countries that they partner with. 
but also um, my question is mainly for Diana. I'm also a journalist, a freelance journalist, and you raised the issue that um, women in these mining, in the mining community that you went to, uh, raised their concerns about not being empowered and not being included in the processes. But when you were engaging with them, did you get a sense that they even understood what a just transition means and what this implies for them as women. I mean, in the framework, they are one of the uh, key groups that have been identified to benefit from the transition. But when you spoke to them, did you get a sense that they even understood what this means? And also, um, speaking to the miners as well, if you were able to speak to them, what did they say to you about this whole process where their livelihood is obviously going to be affected, but there's also opportunities um, for them to sort of get reskilled or absorbed into the new industry of uh, renewables? Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Maybe we can start with Ika, just in relation to the investment and, and, and skills up, upgrade and then done after that. Oh, yeah, contra um, considering the entrepreneurship in Africa, I just know some good local company who just do something like improve, uh, improve the skills, improve the digital skills, and he just run a big network to, uh, to in educate the local engineers and also to help them find a job. So actually there are many founders doing such things and I think this is a kind of good opportunity for all uh, young generation to find a job. And besides that, there are many Chinese uh, companies want to bridge gaps between the Chinese investors and uh, the African founders. Actually, I have turned several roadshows held by Chinese investors who invite a group of uh, African founders who visit China and also pitch their uh, um, business models and pitch their deck to just attract many uh, investors to invest in them. I think that's another thing, uh, for example, cooperation among the China, among China and uh, Africa to do, do business to uh, support the local entrepreneurship together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, the ladies that I spoke to, especially in uh, Mildelberg, um, I think their main concern is that um, although there have been these consultations by the PCC, they are not well empowered in terms of what is just energy transition. So there is lack of empowerment because what, what, what their concerns was that um, these consultations takes place after a long time and uh, PCC doesn't come back and, and engage with them. Um, in terms of the, the job losses, um, some of the workers that we interviewed in Mildelberg, they were not aware, especially in terms of the decommissioning of Gomarty, it was just a hearsay. They were hearing that Gomarty is going to be decommissioned, but uh, there were concerns about um, what will happen in future or life after coal. But um, recently I made a follow-up uh, on, 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 on some of the people around um, Mildelberg. Um, they are happy with, uh, I think now Gomarty started uh, the repurposing and skills um, upgrading. So it's, it's, I think it's, it's, there's, there's, they are reaching some way. There's, um, I think nobody lost their jobs. Since commodities started the repurposing, I think they're in the, the safe hands. It's just a, a, a project that is, that is ongoing. Fantastic, thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much for all the information that uh, you share with us today. I have a question for Gideon. It's like a kind of rhetorical question, but it's a question. I want to know how can we develop and sustain a digital diplomacy when we have Lord shading every day, every month? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions? There were, there were hands up. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this question is directed to Dr. Chitanga. So um, we, we realize that in the wake of globalization, the world has become very, very small. 
and you've got people, so many people, more especially within the African context, that are working for companies that are abroad. And um, my question is, with regards to both the Chinese and the American, what are they doing within the African context to try to close the digital gap to ensure that people have access to digital tools that allow them to work abroad? Is one country doing more than the other? Um, yes, that's the question. Thank you. Uh, sorry, my question will be quite specific to our online speakers because I'm currently based in Harare and um, it's a very fascinating research. Just one point I wanted to double check because you mentioned about the energy solutions for the tobacco industry, like it either be coal or the uh, endangered trees. So I'm wondering if there are any thoughts from the Chinese enterprises are trying to implement like uh, solar panels or like energy storage solutions for that because I think for China they also have the competitive edge regarding the supply chain. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Gideon, do you want to take that and then, then we'll, we'll go to Shang. Talking about the digital diplomacy, uh, how is this uh, yielding to enhance technology transfer between China and uh, Africa, and are there any inhibitions brought by intellectual property restrictions? Thank you. So the, the three questions are, are all related. I think uh, barriers in terms of uh, intellectual property or what China or the US, um, what the two major powers, technological powers are doing in terms of uh, I think improving the technological conditions in, uh, in Africa, specifically related to people who are working from abroad and so on. The issue of power and energy, and that's why I said sometimes when you think about digital diplomacy, it's, and in a broader discussion like this, it's better to, to look at it in a broader way. Basic technologies that, are, that we use they require power and energy and so and other infrastructure that are, are related primarily and within the interest of diplomacy right the african continent and african countries just as the us and china they seek to advance their interests so that is very important to to understand but also the way and the means through which they advance these uh, interests it can be it can exclude interest of other countries or it can create a, a influences which are negative and uh, in this case i think that the structure of international property rights which is a question in my view which is um, regulated uh, beyond a lot of African countries because first we don't uh, produce uh, these technologies but the two major countries which uh, produce these uh, uh, technologies broadly uh, they own the technologies and they have the, the intellectual rights to these technologies and to that in its own it's a key factor to that at least minimizes um, the room or the space of other countries to claim or to to produce a similar related or different technologies based on on the regulations i think a, a legal expert could even give a, a far much better answer but we've seen that with um, the production of uh, covid uh, uh, drugs and it was a big debate africa seeking to produce its own drugs and these uh, intellectual property laws uh, at least becoming a major issue uh, i am not a, 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 a an expert in, in international law but for sure uh, i am aware that uh, we have a problem there and um, uh, it's a it's a major major challenge but i think beyond that uh, the starting point would be the extent of uh, investment by different African countries into producing new technologies, into research, the research that goes into researching new technologies. Uh, the social media uh, big players uh, that we, we use, they are mainly divided between the US, China, and so on and so on. 
we do not have a single social media company in Africa or you think of Teams, Zoom, and so on. We don't even have a single one in Africa. LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, TikTok is a, is, a, is a big Chinese company that covers much of the West. Western leaders use them. We do not have these institutions in Africa. So it is, it is difficult to even start to talk about agency. It's like dancing in someone's house. You see, I think that's how I can illustrate it. It doesn't matter how much you can dance, but it's, your, it's not your house. It's not your only house. The regulations that applies within running that house or that home may not be yours. And I think this is important. And I'm saying this because is, uh, at the moment, at this historical juncture, we see a lot of interest in, in, in the African continent, whether from the US, Europe. I think China moved this interest to a different level. One major issue for media practitioners that they should be, you should be looking at is at least to push for this research and production of our own technologies and creating our own big tech companies, whether it's in social media and other sectors. I, I believe that potentially will um, at least increase uh, our own continental and national agents in different nations, whether it's within the space of digital diplomacy and other business sectors that are feed into or rely on new technologies. Great. Uh, Sean, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you for your question. I think that's really a fascinating suggestion, like to consider solar panels, whether that can replace the current um, use of coal or timber. And for the case of Chinese companies, as I mentioned before, um, they mainly use um, coal because um, they mainly deal with commercial farmers. And according to my conversation with and some farmers in Jimba, um, they're telling me that currently, even though TNZ, the company of TNZ, they're also supplying um, them with um, coal. However, they're telling me that they do not, I mean, a lot of them do not get coal from TNZ. They also have the option to get the coal by themselves. So in the cases of the farmers that I interviewed, most of them got coal from Wengi, which is a place in, in Zimbabwe that's rich in coal that's near the Big Falls. And they just um, drive their tractors to Wengi and then they will bring the coal back. So I think that's, the, um, that's something that most of the commercial tobacco farmers are doing in Zimbabwe. And I think they're quite satisfied with that. And in case of um, in case of solar panels, actually, um, I mean, I have little knowledge of solar panels, like um, how that might work in the case of tobacco curing. But I assume this will be more energy efficient. But I'm not really sure whether um, it will be like very cost effective. I mean, whether or not it will be expensive, because at the end of the day, the cost has to be undertaken by the farmers. And currently, I think. Curing using coal is not that expensive. I mean, um, I think no farmer complained to me about that, but um, I do think solar panel is something to consider since curing using coal has some environmental implications. And there is something that I want to add as well, that is regarding um, what the Chinese companies are doing in terms of um, like curbing the negative implications of curing. That is, um, I know TNZ along with BAT, ZLT, and um, MTC, they're setting up an organization to um, like promote reforestation. Um, they're actually not doing this through TIMB or Ministry of Agriculture because the manager told me that they don't really trust whether if they, I mean, if they don't really trust um, that if they give the money to the ministry, they will do that reforestation job. So they just set up the organization by themselves and then every year they will have um, conferences and also they will have a target of how many trees they're going to plant every year. And I think they're doing pretty well. I haven't seen like that project um, on the ground. However, according to my discussions with some management board members, I think it's a very ambitious, ambitious initiative that they're undertaking. Thank you.
Thanks so much. And thank you for everyone for this rich session. It was really, really fascinating. Um, we'll, we'll end it here and we we'll look forward to continuing the conversations during lunch. Thanks so much.